Welcome to the Next Level Life Show, Lifestyle Entrepreneur Edition. I am your host, Bill Hargenrader, creator of the Next Level Life and best-selling author of Mars Journey, Call to Action. I got a great guest for you today, Kip Brooks. Good morning, Kip. Good morning. Thanks for having me, Bill. Yeah, awesome. Kip's a good friend. Uh, he's also a, uh, an excellent leadership and life coach. I'm going to use bio, and then we'll get into uh, his story. We'll go into some of his tips for on, on life and his philosophy on, on you know, what leadership means, um, how to overcome tragedy, and then also go into uh, Kip as an independent consultant. And he's also pursuing the leadership coaching um, at the same time. So I can relate to that with working a nine to five job, plus doing my lifestyle entrepreneur business. So he's gonna give some tips and some tactics on how to pull it off. But uh, for his bio, Kip Brooks is a certified neuro linguistic programming practitioner. He's a leadership and life coach, a speaker, and a trainer, and part of the John Maxwell family. In his book, Success Memoirs of an F Up, Kip details how they grew up as battles with suicide death of his father when he was a teenager, and how when their baby Skylar died, he and his wife decided to make her a donor in hopes to save another family from going through what they were going through. Now as a speaker, trainer, and coach, he works one-on-one -on -one in teams to transform, or in teams, to transform the hearts of former F-ups, leaders, and anyone who wants more so that together we might come to know our most extraordinary selves and transform the human experience on the planet. I love that, Kip. Welcome again. Thank you. Yeah, man. So, um, can you share some of your story? Like, I mean, yes, I covered a lot of stuff there, but like, what's, 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 what do we uh, need to know about Kip Brooks? Man, well, um, I focus a lot too, uh, not just on leadership, but uh, what I call rebirth coaching. Okay. Uh, yeah, you and I have spoken about that before, but um, where it comes from is, you know, I completely just. I never built a life to destruct. I never aimed for anything. I never really built any kind of life growing up. I was suicidal as young as eight years old. And so I never set any goals. I never uh, had any dreams or path to follow. So it just led to this, you know, wandering around through life lost. And then finally, uh, went through, you know, uh, drinking problems, drug addictions, and then Finally, just got tired of it um, in my well in my twenties. Yeah. Then um, actually, um, uh, my I was arrested multiple times, and my final one, um, a police officer actually kind of gave me a gift and flipped a switch in me, made me realize, uh, you know the. Uh, the consequences of all the decisions I'd made. I'd been blaming everybody for, you know, anybody I could find I was pointing fingers at and blaming for my life. And finally it just clicked in that moment that, man, I brought all this on myself and I was starting to bring down people around me, the only people I cared about. So I started uh, cleaning up, shaping things up and, you know, started working so-called real jobs, you know, the nine to five and yeah. uh, get on a, a different path and, it was a long, uh, long path, a lot of fumbles and trips and stumbles, but um, finally discovered the, you know, self-development world, and man, it's just been awesome ever since. Getting better all the time, and you know, always constantly learning. Still some trip ups here and there, and but it's been an excellent ride. Uh, and I've finally, in the last couple of years, been able to find like true gratitude for all the mess ups I've had in the past <laughs> and all the uh, failures because I just realized what it's given me. Um, so now, you know, I, I like to uh, help clients not only improve their business, but, you know, just their life, just embracing their inner power and, um, and just realizing what a gift every mistake, every failure can be yeah. and finding a way to reframe that and move with it. Yeah, no, that, that that's awesome. And I, I, so many things that I talk about, but uh, I find that for a lot of people that are that do a lifestyle business um, or a business in the in the expert space, something that they're really passionate about, um, it is almost a form of, of personal development. It's not just going out and making money. So I think that the personal development angle, the business skills, they they go hand in hand because when you're doing something you're passionate about, spreading your message, that's that's part of you uh, being shared with the world. Do you, I mean, do you agree with that? Oh yeah, totally. Um, so you can't improve one without improving the other because you're in the business you're in so if you improve yourself there well it's going to affect you in your personal life and vice versa yeah. and and so people ask me questions sometimes like what's three business tips and three life tips I'm like 
I have a hard time separating those sometimes because I've seen how one will affect the other. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, what yeah. did that uh, police officer say to you? Uh, uh, it wasn't so much what he said. It was what he did. Um, my uh, wife, Shannon, we were just dating at the time. And, you know, I was, uh, I had my own addictions, but I was also, you know, dealing drugs um, because I always uh, bounced between jobs when I was younger. I had a hard time staying anywhere. And it was because I would have these ideas of how to improve things. And, um, you know, people convinced me I was crazy, but what it was was that entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. And I'd see ways of improving things and I couldn't get people to listen. I, I hadn't developed the skills to deliver my message properly. And I didn't really understand building that relationship and trust. And so I created this story that that was the only world I would fit in. Um, I had seen my dad uh, do it as a kid growing up. So uh, it just kind of happened. Um, well, my, uh, my wife, Shannon, was with me. And I got busted. And um, she just happened to be there. She, you know, she wasn't involved in any way, shape or form. She was actually the good egg, right. but, uh, he planted evidence right in front of me, made it completely obvious. Um, and he didn't say a word. He just looked me dead in the eye as, uh, two other cops were handcuffing me and he just took her purse and put evidence in it, took it out of his pocket, put it in her purse and then pulled it out. And he said, look at that. She's coming down with us. And, uh, it, uh, for a split second, I just wanted to tear into pieces, but then, it just instantly snapped. Yeah. And I realized it's not his fault. I gave him everything he needed. I've made all these decisions in my life. Everything just kind of flashed before my eyes that, um, uh, you know, all my choices had led to this, you know, one point in time. And I was like, man, I can't believe I did this. It's like I'd only seen, I only believed I was destructing my own life. And now I was finally given, um, you know, the vision to be able to see what it was doing to people I cared about. Um, so right then I just uh, made a choice in my head. I was like, this is never going to happen to me again. Wow. I'm never going to allow it to hurt anybody else. It's like, I don't know how, but I'm getting out of this and I'm never coming back. And that's what happened. Um, took a lot of money, but you know, we got out of all of that, cleaned everything up and uh, went on with our lives and, yeah, started, I can't even say rebuilding at that point because, like I say, I never really built anything. It started completely at ground zero. Had no idea what I was going to do yeah. or where to go. Um, but through the uh, through the course of life, um, started figuring out things that I actually learned from that life and how to apply them in, you know, in a uh, more productive life. Um, and realized I was good at sales and customer service and things like that. Yeah. I took what I'd learned there and what it helped me and just, you know, applied it. No, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's great. I'm still reeling from that, that story. Cause I was there and, you know, envisioning Danielle, my wife and like a situation like that. And that just on the inside, man, that just, that just definitely clear, clears you up to a bit. Like, yeah, a little bit of rage, but then like, crap, like this is, this is for real. It's somebody outside of myself that's, that's, that's being affected by what I'm doing in a very real um, way with real consequences. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a powerful story right there. And I've, I've not even heard that story before from you, but <laughs> <laughs> definitely uh, make, give, give me pause and I'm, you know, taking some uh, account of some more things that I'm grateful for. Maybe, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll stop doing some of the other things. Not not drug dealing or anything like that, but uh, <laughs> so uh, we'll get more to some of your story uh, from your additional story. I know about um, your you know baby Skyler, and you know, that's that's very powerful and impactful, and you've helped to um, really helped to uh, motivate and influence other people um, through that story. But um, I'd like to talk more about some of your influences. You said you got into, into personal development, like where. Where did that come uh, um, come around to you? Is that through you know training, seminars, books? Uh, so here, how does that also fit into your timeline? If you're figuring out I need to rebuild or create from ground zero, here's personal development. How do those two intersect? It took me a little while to find it. Um, I had never really heard of you know motiv uh, motivational speakers or anything like that at that point. You know, I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't in that community at all. Um, but finally, I uh, what first opened uh, the door for me 
to it was I stumbled across a YouTube video and it was just someone had put some audio over you know a collection of different pictures and things and it was uh, this guy just telling a story and um, and I was like man who is that I've got to find out and it was a, a guy named Eric Tom uh, Eric Thomas yeah, you know, he's a hip hop preacher and he was telling that story that he got from Dr Dennis Kimbrough. Um, about the guru and you know when you want success as bad as you want to breathe then you'll be successful and I was just so moved by the story I remember I got teary-eyed and just got goosebumps I was like, man I've got to get more of that and uh, it wasn't listed in the credits um, on the particular video I saw who he was so it took me a little while to track it down and then um, I started getting some of his stuff and then um, through him, heard him talking about well, not just Dr. Dennis Kimbrough, but also brought, uh, Bob Proctor. And so then I started, I was like, who's this Bob Proctor guy? And I, you know, just started collecting little pieces and then, um, yeah, just collected audio because when I was at work at that time, I was a technician, I was in the back, I was a behind the scenes guy. And most of the time, so every time I was away from anybody, I would just have my earphones in and I would just listen to audio books or any little, snippets I could find of a keynote speech or anything and I just deleted all the music off my um, iPod and just loaded it with you know just hundreds of hours of audio and I was kind of obsessed with it um, and I you know, started noticing the energy shift in me and then the thought process and um, so I would just go to school while I was at work and then go to school while I was in my car and you know it just became constant um, and luckily my wife got on board with it which is yeah. listening in the car time, like no radio, nothing. <laughs> yeah, listen to this, and luckily she was open to it, um, and so we both kind of got on the course and uh, on that path, and you know started supporting each other. But yeah, um, I have issues reading. I love to read. I can't walk past a bookstore without going in it. But uh, I've taken speed reading courses and things, but I have a little bit of dyslexia and other stuff, so I have issues physically reading. And I don't have a lot of time for it between kids and everything else, but I listen to at least a few hours of audio every single day. Yeah. Um, so I get everything in. Yeah. Through yeah that, that's, that's awesome. It's also great uh, pointing out, you know, it's good to have a significant other on board. And that's not always the case. Uh, but basically my advice and that, 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 that scenario is just to keep doing you and eventually, yeah. um, you know, your spouse or significant other will, you know, catch on or they'll move on yeah it's uh, a good friend of mine um his story with his wife actually went the opposite direction she was oh. on board for a little bit and then she was like ah, this just isn't fun yeah. and um and he was having a blast with it and he just you know they they try to work things out but after like two years he's okay i'm just being drugged down and you know we're fighting all the time it's like so this is no relationship at all and they separated ways and now they're good friends. Um, and he actually kind of mentors her. So she's starting to get on board, but you know, they both moved on. And, um, yeah, we, we hold on sometimes, uh, too much to past relationships that have served their purpose. Um, we have this false idea. Sometimes I see with people that we think every relationship is supposed to last a lifetime. And I don't think it really is. You outgrow them or they outgrow you or something. We, Sometimes it's only moments. Sometimes it's years, months, you know, whatever. But it's all uh, it's all to get you to the next step. Some of them are meant to go a lot of time. Yeah. Um, especially relationships like you and Danielle. It's just obvious. It's you know, it's a lifetime thing. But um, so we waste so much energy trying to rebuild something that's you know not serving us or not serving them. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, no, that, that's uh, and it's also a bit of it about about knowing if you're aware of that. Um, about so for me, I, I just growing up and going through some of the things uh, that I, I went through, I was very separated from people, and I kind of separated myself from people socially, uh, mentally, you, you know, sometimes even just you know physically. But what I realized is that I am a people person. That I do love people, and that I love interacting with people. And I would get kind of sad when I meet somebody cool at an airport or meet, and then go, but then I just realized like, that's, that's part of the beauty of life as well. Like those, you can have an awesome interaction, a couple of follow-up interactions. Um, and then that's just that as the beauty and the splendor of, of, of life, walking by a pretty flower, having a great conversation. And that goes, that just makes life, um, more beautiful versus just saying, I'm going to be withdrawn or not talk to people because 
you know, mentally you go through the scenario and it's like, what's the point if you're not going to be seeing them years from now? It's just, it's walking by a beautiful flower, having that beautiful conversation. It just makes life more fulfilling for me. I love that metaphor for it too. I never thought about it like that, but yeah, I just, yeah. I just invented it, but um, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the metaphor, not the actual thought process. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> cool. So then, um, Let's let's get back a little more to 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 your story. If, if you want to share a little bit about um, more, I guess the more defining or or painful or powerful moments in your life with your you know baby Skylar, is that something you're you're cool talking about? Oh yeah, totally. Um, yeah, that was uh, um, you know obviously hugely impactful. We went in, uh, we found out while Shannon was still pregnant. We went in for a fun three D. Uh, ultrasound to find out if it's a boy or a girl, you know, get the pictures and all that. And um, luckily, it was an ultrasound tech that we knew we uh, were friends with before she went out on her own and started the 3D thing. And um, she was our ultrasound tech with our oldest son, Jaden. Yeah. And we went in, it was a Friday afternoon, and uh, you know, cut out at work early and just, uh, yeah, it was a, you know, just gonna be a real fun day. And we had all these things planned for how we were gonna, you know, let everybody, let the world know, um, let Jaden know if he was gonna have a little uh, brother or a little sister, you know, whatever. And um, uh, yeah, we found out instantly because um, Roxanne, our ultrasound tech, is like the best on the East Coast, or you know, one of she's top dog. That's who they call when they need a good reading. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah, she just found out. We could tell by the shift in her, you know, physicality. Just said, okay, something bad is going on, and um, she wasn't technically supposed to give the diagnosis, but she's such an expert, you know. Um, she gave us the news, and um, and plus to the relationship we had with her, um, she felt comfortable enough, and you know, we gave full disclaimer. It's like we're not holding you responsible for anything, but we need some information. Um, and, yeah, you know, it was devastating. It was probably about a 20 minute drive home. And I remember Shannon talking the whole time to me, the whole drive home. I don't remember a word of it. Um, it was just, there was no audible sound at all. It was just blankness. Um, and then, uh, um, we got home, got the call from our doctor. They looked over the results, confirmed the diagnosis and, our midwife, who was actually became great friends with us, she. What was, the, what was the diagnosis? Oh, the diagnosis was anencephaly, and what it is is a failure um, or a um, deformation in the brain. Uh -huh. uh, it doesn't fully um, form. Um, there's different levels of severity. Uh, as we went on, we found out hers was actually quite severe. Mm -hmm. Originally, she was given a sixty percent chance of being born alive. By the time she was actually born, that had dropped down to ten percent. Wow! Um, but she was actually born alive, um, and she lived for ninety-nine minutes. And yeah, when we got the diagnosis that day, um, the day she was born, we knew that if she was born alive, that there was a good chance she wouldn't make it through the day. So you know, it started out initially that was the day we feared more than anything. But luckily, the different steps we took along the way. Um, I actually turned that into being the greatest day I've ever experienced. Um, you know, we started meeting different families that had gone through similar things and we would, you know, life is about asking the right questions. You know, Tony Robbins talks about that. Just about everybody does. And luckily, um, I don't know where it came from because I was never, uh, at that point, I was never really good at that part, but, um, we would start asking people and finding out, okay, what's, what's your biggest regret and what's your happiest memory from your own experience? And we would jot down the main thing we wanted with those, with those regrets. Um, cause it's like, okay, this is where we don't want to be. How do we get to the opposite of that? And what is, you know, what is the opposite of that and how do we get there? So we started just building memories and my wife had the wherewithal to, um, fairly early in to say, you know what? this is the only time right now in the present that we're guaranteed to be parents of Skylar while she's here. So, so how do we make that enjoyable instead of, you know, worrying about 
oh, she's going to die, you know, prematurely and all that. She's like, let's focus on the present and take what we've got now and be grateful for that. So, you know, we went along, we went to build a bear and had the heartbeat recorded and, um, and a wolf, my son picked out a bunny for my wife and instead of doing a baby shower, we did what's called an angel shower. Um, and that gave other people permission to realize we're okay with it and we're dealing with it. Yeah. And, you know, we're open to talk about it and work through it. And, um, and then with all the, um, changes in organ donation that we made along the way because there was no protocol for someone of her age, uh, like two years old or younger, uh, in our area. So we had to battle that. We got some things changed. Um, and there were some new technologies that had just been brought over from like, Europe here to the States. And we were able to help them get, uh, some recognition and, you know, which led to more funding and stuff. So there was a lot of huge breakthroughs that, we had no idea that we could ever accomplish. Um, but it was just, we were trying to get to a point and it was just like, you know, side effects of benefits that came with it. Um, yeah. cause our midwife brought up the idea early on of organ donation and it just fit. We're like, yeah, if we can keep another family from feeling what we feel right now, it'll make it, you know, you know, just, a little more worthwhile uh for lack of better words you know it's it, we give it a purpose um and uh and that ended up just shifting after it was all said and done i really reflected on my life i was like man i've been living what i thought was right and good and you know growing in all these areas but um i was like look what she did in 99 minutes and look at all the life i've wasted hmm. i said like, how can i start impacting the world better and I was like, cause right now I've just been living for us and really just kind of going to work, paying the bills and being like, you know, I'm, I'm not in this world anymore that I used to be in. I'm not in trouble with cops. I'm not breaking laws. I'm doing good. And then that just shifted. And it's like, no, I can be great. Um, I can do something that affects everybody, you know, impacts the world a lot better. Yeah. Um, so that really kind of fueled the fire and, that's what it's been. Uh, that was 2010. And, um, yeah, that was the second just huge impactful moment in my life that just fueled all this and, you know, started bringing us the seminars every chance we got, we stopped going on vacations and started spending money to go to seminars, yeah, right, right. Uh, which people thought we were just <clears throat> loco for, but, um, yeah, it's made a huge, uh, huge impact. And, I, uh, I reflect on it all the time. Almost every time we get on a plane, um, going to a seminar or something, I just think about it. Man, it all came from that. Um, and, you know, we, we stay in contact with all those people. We hear constantly of uh, new things that are happening in our area for organ donation yeah. all because of her 99 minutes. Um, so it, it holds me accountable. Um, so when things get hard, you know, in this entrepreneurial roller coaster that we're all on, I'm like, ah, got to keep rolling with it. Uh, just, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, just uh, that's, that's a powerful story. That's, I mean, it just, it has one of the, the lessons that I'm, I'm getting from that story and your story earlier is it's important to pay attention to what's going on, important to commit yourself to personal development. But sometimes it's just the world. It's just, you know, life that happens that, that shows up and, you know, kind of wakes you up. And I guess sometimes doing the personal development or, or working on yourself prepares you or allows you to be more of your true self in, in those moments where um, where you're giving an opportunity. There was like in my mind, they're like, you know, like really you look back on your on your past and your history. And there's these really key like moments that are like kind of like these crossroads. And so sometimes people are saying, why am I listening to this, this, these, um, audio books all day long or nothing's really happening. And sometimes it's just preparing you for when life does show up and give you that opportunity, um, to make the, the right choice or the, the better choice for you. And, and then also to get out of yourself. And, you know, when you get out of yourself and start thinking about how you can help other people or help get them through traumatic and, you know, scary times, that's just, that's, that's what it's all about for, 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 for me and for you and for your stories. I mean, I haven't gone through that, but hearing your story, once again, I'm just like, 
what can I do better? How can I be more and, you know, do more for the world? So th thanks for sharing that, Kim. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, man. So we're going to, um, we got about 10 minutes left. So let's, um, let's, which focus here? We got, um, we'll do two things. One, let's do a scenario. Let's say uh, I'm an F up, right? I mean, I, I've been an F up in the past. What, um, what are some of the things that you would, would ask me or what are some of the things that, you know, you would ask or direct or, or guide um, in a situation where somebody who might be watching this right now may have been an F up in the past, um, may have been a screw up, may be currently a screw up. What are, what are some things that you would um, let that person know? Typically, um, early on, um, one of the biggest key things that helped me is, I say, a, a situation with a police officer, um, and it's repeated over and over, is, uh, you know, accepting my responsibility, hmm. no matter what, you know, I've had, um, crooked business partners that have put me in spots, you know, bad accountants and stuff, but, hmm. uh, and it's so easy to get caught up in, Oh, they did this. They stabbed me in the back. They, you know, screwed this up or whatever. And, um, the more we hold on to that story, the less we get accomplished. And, you know, I picked that account I picked that business partner. It's like, I have responsibility in that. So it's like, I can't do anything about them. Um, but I can do things about my choices. You know, I control that. And I, that's the biggest thing I think for just about anybody is accepting our responsibility in it. Um, so when I work with people, it's like, okay, where are you, what's the biggest story of blame that you're throwing out there? Hmm. How can we reframe that to where you see, what your part of responsibility is it might just be, you know, some minor, I mean, you could be completely victim, but holding on to that victim mentality will never allow you to be, you know, in a victory mindset. And so you just learn from all of that, but we hold on to that story so much. We don't allow ourselves to see, you know, the knowledge we gain from it. Yeah. Um, so it's just reframing that and starting to let go of some of that. Um, and, you know, it taps into some forgiveness work too, but, uh, which was <laughs> probably the hardest thing for me to ever, um, wrap my head around and really start to accept and, uh, take action on was forgiveness. <laughs> That's a constant work, but, uh, I was like, no, you know, my family could rule the Olympics if it was an event of holding a grudge. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, that, that was a lot of, uh, a lot of work it still goes on daily, <laughs> constantly remind myself of it. But, um, yeah, that's uh, that's usually what I find is typically the biggest holdback for most people. I yeah. deal with. Um, is just being able to let that go. You know, your story is hugely uh, just a beautiful example of forgiveness and moving on with it. Um, and actually, your story has helped hold me accountable. I always remind myself of Hill. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> like yeah. you're standing right there. Um, so thank you for you know sharing your story in the past. Yeah. No, and I, I have to remind myself of that of that sometimes too. But for forgiveness is powerful. It's a powerful. It's it's a power for you when you forgive. You're 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 healing. That, you're letting that person heal. You're letting yourself heal and you're letting yourself move forward. And I I take stock. I try to forgive myself all the time. If I mess up, you take responsibility. Yeah. Forgiveness isn't just forgiving the people that you know you were blaming. It's also forgiving yourself as well. Because if I if I'm holding a grudge against myself, I'm holding myself back. So there are times where I'm just like, yo, I'm, I forgive you, man. You, <laughs> I forgive you, Bill. Let's, let's move yeah. on. Let's, let's get this going, you know? Yeah. And, uh, uh, we get hung up on that too. Like accepting responsibility doesn't mean beating ourselves up sure. and taking the grudge on ourselves. It's like, just, okay, own up to it and just move on. It's like, don't beat yourself up. Learn to laugh at yourself about things. And, you know, <clears throat> but yeah, forgiving yourself is, every bit as important, if not more important than forgiving the others. But, um, uh, I remember somebody brought it up to me. They're like, you know, when you're holding this grudge, um, you're letting them, you know, control your mind constantly, but they're not thinking about you at all. Nope. And I said, not at all. Oh man. So that really ticked me off. <laughs> but that was what fired me up. To, okay. I've got to start putting this into effect. Cause I was like, yeah, yeah. I started realizing how much time I was spending focusing on this grudge that was getting me nowhere, and they had no clue what was going on. Yeah, so, I'm not hurting anybody but me. So, uh, so um, 
so that that's that's kind of getting more of a helping to someone's a game responsibility, maybe get rid of some blocks that are keeping them from moving forward. But what about somebody that has no idea what they want to do, that knows that they're meant for more, know they, they want to do more, um, but they're just like, great, I free, I've I've freed the blocks up. Now here I'm at. What what kind of advice would you give to help find their passion or, or what? Yeah. This is what I do because that's I say a lot of uh, my own story was it's like okay I'm trying to get somewhere different but I don't know where yeah. um, you know and I I've heard a lot of speakers a lot of coaches say go back to the ages of like it varies but usually seven to like thirteen or fourteen I say like, whatever you wanted to be there there's you know there's hints there little uh, clues to get you there. Well, like I say, I was suicidal at eight years old. I didn't plan for anything. So I didn't see the point dream and I didn't see possibility. I, I was hopeless. Um, so uh, I would go back to that. I'm like, well, I wanted to be dead then. What does that mean? Now? <laughs> and um, so that doesn't always work. You know, um, I have seen it. It works quite a bit with people. But what it, usually I do is work with people. It's like, okay, kind of. You know, tell your story and we'll look for clues and um, your little signs along the way of little strengths that you've, uh, you know, demonstrated in your own life and then um, your different knowledge that you've acquired. And um, just look for, you know, areas of higher emotion during that, especially if I'm one on one, I can, you know, kind of read their body language and, um, sensory acuity and things and um but also it can be done by yourself just by journaling out and just kind of going through it and then you go back and reread it but you look at the areas that kind of impacted you the most um or uh as you're writing it out or thinking about it like where did your emotional level go high at and what was the cause for that and like where did you um what kind of things excite you a little bit or you know what do you wake up thinking about what do you think about before you go to sleep and you start kind of piecing them together and do a little detective work on your own. Um, and I found it helpful too. I've run some clients through, um, after they do that also, this helps really well with the forgiveness thing, but also yeah. start showing other signs is, um, to help you figure out your own passions is telling the story and the other person's perspective. Uh, it works really good with forgiveness, but it starts just opening your mind up, in different ways and it allows things to start coming in and it's like, okay because you're so focused on your story you know think about the other one right. so when you open up like that it allows you to start seeing all sorts of things differently um and i constantly analyze things in my own life like that now um i'm real big and i've always been into martial arts in and out so i'm a uh, mixed martial arts fan and most of my friends can't stand to ask me who I think is going to win a match because now I can actually see ways that both people, you know, their strengths in both areas. But yeah. um, exercises like this has helped me, uh, you know, discover my own possibilities, but also see the strength and possibility in others. Um, so it just without ever having that goal, like it brought me to that. I had no idea where it was going to take me, but I was just trying to get stuff out of my head yeah. um, and start releasing some things. Um, and it helped open me up to other ideas and you know, journeys that I could go on. So, uh, and every, all the time I realize uh, something I learned that I can apply somewhere or, you know, use to help somebody yeah. you know, uh, tools along the way. So, yeah, I think what's important to kind of add, add to that is, is uh, to embrace, you know, experiential living, embrace trying new things, going out there and, even if you're not necessarily not sure it's your passion, but you're read about somebody that's doing something that's enjoying it, like martial arts, for instance, like take up martial arts, you know, and who knows if you're going to be a professional martial arts fighter, but that'll at least get you active, get you moving, get you to meet new people, see new things. If you're not sure where you're at, start doing new things that, you know, excite you and they will sometimes lead you to the path that, um, you know, that we, you are doing what you're, what you were sent here to do. Um, you're calling and if not guess what you can look back and say hey for for two years when I was younger I did, did MMA for two years, you know Yeah, yeah, at least give you a story. There's, yeah. you know, there's something from every experience to gain um, May not always be like the coolest thing or the most impactful thing, but there's something there um, But yeah, just trying new things and getting out of your comfort zone just starts opening up ideas and it's okay. I didn't like this 
but maybe I would like something over here or, you know, like Freddie Roach thought he wanted to be a boxer. He was really close to, he was in the area, but he was just going down, uh, you know, one of the paths just a little off to the side and he wasn't very good at boxing. He wasn't very successful at it, but he came one of the most well-known coaches of all time. Um, once he, he kept hovering around that world, something kept pulling him back. Uh, and he finally just realized one day he saw a flaw somewhere else. So it's like, once you dove into something, um, you might not be very good at that particular area of it, but just chunk up a little bit is what they call it in NLP, you know, get a, a bigger picture of it, step back and just kind of observe. And yeah. there's signs of there's reasons why we're attracted to different things. Um, and, uh, yeah, it'll lead us there. It's just, we get so obsessed with, we stress ourselves out so much of, Oh man, it, it gotta be this. And you know, the, um, people want to be a music star. And they're like, I love music. It's like, yeah, but you might be a really good producer and you might be horrible on a microphone. But, it's, you know, it's, it's we just focus sometimes too much on the wrong ideas because we start listening to other people too much. Yeah. Um, and so people are like, oh, you love music. You should be a singer. Well, no, I love music. I've got the worst singing voice I think I've ever heard. <laughs> but there's probably something else there for me. But... Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, and then uh, this is gets me. We go on and on, but uh, this is this takes me on, um, you know, your own your own personal journey. You know, call it experiential living. You know, creating, doing things that are fun or excite you now that may either guide you to find what you're passionate about, um, or let's say you already know what you're passionate about, just doing more exciting things. But also, when you look back, you have those stories to tell, but you can see the journey that you were on. So for instance, like now I'm, I'm a lifestyle entrepreneur coach, but you know, my, my current, my, my day job, so to speak, you know, I'm a project manager. I focus on cybersecurity and I focus on innovation. But when I trace back when I was, you know, 17, you know, I was installing fences and 18, 19, 20, I was doing construction and cutting down trees and, you know, doing all these different things where like, how would that get me from here to here? But now that I've done physical labor, now that I manage, you know, IT programs or I manage projects that, you know, create online products, it all ties in because I have a greater appreciation for what it goes in to actually, you know, be out there in the real world. And by actually knowing how to set up a project, physically, you know, purchase the right amount of piping and the, the correct amount of, you know, gauge, you know, fencing to go up and all that, that starts to translate into, well, now I have a physical representation and a model for how to accomplish digital things where some people who've never had that experience, they'll get, they'll get lost and, you know, start looking for those, those things. And I mean, do you have things like that in your life where <sighs> that was like a loaded question, I, I'm sure, <laughs> you do. but you know, what are some of, you know, some of the things that, that you've done, I guess we'll, we'll transition into the, um, maybe some tips for people that are working a nine to five job and want to do more, um, lifestyle business. But what are some things that maybe you could look back on your journey, um, work wise that, that show up in your, in your everyday life now? I've, um, you know, I've had dishwasher jobs, um, uh, helper at a body shop, helper as a construction worker, you know, all these little odd and end jobs, um, and temp jobs. And I didn't learn, or I didn't realize what I learned in the moment, but I, yeah, I constantly look back now. Um, I said, man, I've learned all these little key points. Uh, like I got my work ethic from somewhere. Um, you know, my parents ran a gas station when I was a kid. I was pumping gas as young as four years old yeah. and washing people's windows. Man, I hated that. And I was so mad at them for so long for that. But it gave me um, a work ethic and a hustle because they would drill me, um, you know, about – Anytime I worked at a place they ran, I always had to work harder and better than the other people there. Um, you know, my parents had their flaws, but they would outwork anyone I've ever met. And then uh, I was raised the same way. So I always had that work ethic to kind of push through. And I was just always kind of good at that um, about hustling. Yeah. So now I can't stand to sit still and not be doing anything. Even when I try to relax, I'm like, all right, I start getting bored. Um, but yeah, it took me a long time to figure out how to be grateful for that and figure out what I learned from it and how it had affected me. Um, and, and yeah, dishwasher jobs, it's like they led to somewhere. And it, there's a lot of times, especially early on in the entrepreneurial journey, you know, you're the janitor and the CEO. It's like you've got to be willing to do a little bit of everything in the early stages to build 
you know, build whatever it is you're building. Um, and, uh, and so I don't have a problem, you know, getting dirty and, you know, getting my hands dirty and doing the grunt work. Um, sometimes I actually enjoy it now because it kind of takes me back. And, you know, a lot of those menial jobs, like Einstein worked at, what was a patent office or, um, and he said some of his best ideas came from that. And so because you're able to relax your mind enough and yeah. do things that are just you know, so repetitive and so easy to you. It's like it frees your mind up to start thinking of other things when you're not truly focusing on a solution and you start just kind of daydreaming and other ideas come up. Yeah. Yeah. So still to this day, I'll, I do the dishes at our house. Um, and I find myself just coming up with all kinds of ideas. I've written, written poetry doing that or, you know, pieces of speeches or you know all kinds of stuff just doing the dishes or come up with fun little games to do with the kids you know it's just uh yeah and i don't know what it is about it's i call it active meditation there you go feel and meditate um so i started running i don't enjoy running but once i figured out that i was actually kind of meditating during that um it uh I started finding a passion for it so now i love running i still don't like the physical act of it but I always, or pretty much always, you know, come back feeling more energized and just clearer headed and have tons of stuff to write down or, you know, journal. Um, and I do the same thing, like washing a car or doing dishes. Say so, uh, those little, you know, daily tasks that just seem so menial to us. It's like you can get something out of that. You can, okay, you're not learning something physically washing a dish right now when you're in your 30s or 40s because you've done it for so long. <laughs> so freeing your mind up and just let your mind wander. Um, yeah. And yeah, do that active meditation, just clearing your head and see what comes in. That's great advice. Awesome advice. So we're gonna um we're gonna wrap things up, brother. So uh yeah. anything out there? I mean, I'm gonna post some links to your to your website. Um anything you wanna you got coming up? This this book, uh Confessions of a of a of an F up. Success memoirs, yeah. Or is it success memoirs? Success memoirs of an F up. Is that out now? Is that coming out? Is that coming uh, out? It's getting really close. Uh, I'm actually, um, my editor and I are speaking this week. I wanted it it's pretty much done, but I want to go back and adjust some things because um, I'm putting together an online course based off of it to help people with talk, you know, open up uh, some of their own ideas and discover their, uh, their powers and passions and stuff. So I wanted to go back and with that idea and kind of um, re-edit the book on my own and you know change a couple of things to tie into that a little better because yeah. um, when I originally wrote the book I just kind of wrote the book with just the book in mind and I said oh yeah uh, and then one of my coaches was like, you need to build a course off of this and help others um, that maybe can't get with you in coaching one-on-one -on -one. Um, so give them you know some kind of online resource okay so um, you know the great ideas are always right there in front of us. We just don't always see them. We need that outside person a lot of times. Sure. Um, but yeah, it'll be coming out uh, real soon. Okay. Uh, definitely, I would think by um, uh, by the end of January, but maybe even earlier. Um, so when, we'll do that, we'll, when that comes out, we'll update below uh, below this video with a, a link to the book. In the meantime, we'll post a link to your to your website. But they can reach out to you. People can reach out to you for, um, say hi, uh, ask questions, um, instead of coaching things of that nature, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Love to hear from people. Um, yeah, even if it's just to say hello or uh, any quick questions. Um, uh, I love trying to serve people, even if it doesn't lead into coaching. It's like I love just you know that connection, building that community, yeah. um, and uh, helping in any way I can. Awesome, man. Awesome. This is great. This is great. Uh, I learned a lot about you in the last uh, 30, 30 or 40 minutes or so. This is We can keep going on all day, but we're going to wrap things up. So I want to say uh, thank you for coming on the show, Kip. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again for having me. It was, uh, it was such an honor and best of luck to everybody. Awesome. Okay. So if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel for, for more videos and more updates. And hopefully we'll see you on the next video. All right. Take care.